Merci. OK. Are we ready? <laughs> that wasn't the question. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's just have a very quick recall of a couple of things. We're talking about this guy. Stokes equations. We calculated uh, some Green's functions. I'll write down two of them. So we calculated the Stokes slit. And I'll write this in matrix form. Okay, and we have the stresslet. I checked my signs and mine was correct. And here it's a third order tensor, so I shall put three bars beneath it to denote that. Now, um, actually in, in, continu in continuum theories of uh, rigid rod suspensions, you only go up to a fourth order tensor. Of course, all of all of uh, kind of kinetic theory for rod suspensions has to do with how you how you do a closure to get rid of that fourth order tensor. Okay. Uh, we had the reciprocal theorem. And it said if I had uh, two solution pairs to the Stokes equation, then they would satisfy div dot sigma v minus sigma tilde u is equal to zero. And if there was a body in there, there was an integral form that you could write down and express things in terms of stresses associated with each of them. And then yesterday when I was solving this problem about how fast a body moves when it has a prescribed surface velocity, I was a little how do, how do I put it? I was, I was working on two hours of sleep. <laughs> Just put it that way. So there was that application. And I think I'll bring up the, well, I have the room. On, voila. So I imagined that I had a body that in the lab frame had a surface velocity that looked like a translational piece plus a body frame piece, which is a propulsive piece. So I have a body. And if I fixed it in place, you would have some prescribed U body velocity on it, if I were holding it in place, okay? And now I'm going to let it go and let it determine its own translational velocity. And so my 
lab frame velocity will be the translational velocity plus the surface, the UB velocity. So U gamma, lab frame. On the surface is some velocity to be determined plus the surface velocity. So let me call this U gamma of Y. And here Y is on the surface. And then I said you could go back to the calcul famous calculation of Stokes for surface stress under an applied force and a, and a determined velocity to determine using the reciprocal theorem that U was equal to minus, in the case of a sphere, just to make it simple, because we know a sphere, u was minus 1 over 4 pi a squared, the surface integral over the sphere, dsy, ub of y, so on. Okay, so You can, con that's right, that's all, that's all the reciprocal theorem calculates for you. That's exactly right. That's its magic, that's its defect, if you want to call it that. Uh, front. No. <laughs> it's the big one. Okay. Yes. That's right. And so you can imagine, you, I want you to solve another problem as a homework problem. So instead, what I want you to calculate is what is the force it would take to hold such a body in place? It's the converse problem, okay? So what I just calculated was the velocity of a body with the prescribed body velocity moving under a condition of zero force. Now I'm saying hold it in place and calculate the force. This is actually a very important problem because, you know, oftentimes uh, swimming objects are held in place by a pipette so you can observe the flows that they produce, right? But those flows that they produce, that, that's what you're getting is that body piece. And if you really wanted to know what that flow would look like in the lab frame where you might be able to measure it if it were moving freely, then you have to calculate, you have to have figured out what that translational velocity is to add it on. It's not quite the same. Okay, so that's an exercise. Calculate the, the force to hold the swimmer in place. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. Okay, so now here the, the minus sign makes perfect sense, okay? So here's the problem that Blake looked at. Blake looked at problems where this UB is now say, let's draw it this way. I'll put an axis, that's the Z hat direction. And so I'll call this, I hate using theta for polar angles, so I'll be civilized and I'll call it phi. Why anyone should use theta on something that goes from zero to pi has always mystified me. <laughs> so there's a little, little bias I have. Anyway, there's the polar angle. And, and he looked at surface velocities that were just along the polar tangent vector. 
to the surface, and so they're actually symmetric. And so this, this polar tangent vector points downwards, right, by the way it's constructed. And so this is a velocity where the surface velocity is all going, well, if you were positive, if that u phi were positive, then it would be doing something like that. So it would be negative in direction, and you would expect to get a positive velocity out of it, right, because you're pushing fluid back to displace yourself upwards, and that's what this is expressing. That's why it has that minus sign. Okay? And so Blake wrote this down, a special case. Let me just write down Blake's more general, but I'll just say the, the, the interesting special case of what Blake wrote down. The special, special case. And what he did is he just took two uh, azimuthal modes. So here, uh, let's see, did I write it down? Yeah. And so here this u phi was b1 sine phi. If b1's positive, this is, this is completely positive as phi goes from 0 to pi, plus b2 sine 2 phi. So this will then change sine at the equator. Okay? And so it turns out that... Uh, well, okay, if you think about this and you, you stick it into that integral, there's a, there's a metric coefficient to sine phi floating around in there. So the first term will give a contribution and the second will not. Okay, so in this you will just get a velocity field that depends only on B1. And then he had, having solved the Stokes equations, in the exterior you can see for those different B, B2s then how the outer flow is perturbed. Right? And that's what I'm showing here. So there's a parameter, beta, which is the absolute value of B1 over B2. Okay? And the calculation here is that the, the velocity, in this case, is some coefficient, which I couldn't quite get right. It has a pi, and as soon as it has a pi, I can't get them to cancel, right? So um, alpha times b1 z hat. Okay, so that's the calculation. That's the velocity that you get just using those two components. But here's what it looks like for different, for different cases as you change b2, essentially. So just imagine that b1 is 1, and you're just changing b2. So what happens as you change b2? So let's say that that's just 1. If I'm looking from the phi equals 0 pole, up to, you know, down to phi equals pi, there's this B1 baseline, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm adding or subtracting a piece that looks like that, right? So what's happening is that if I add something at the top that looks like this, I'm increasing the propulsive velocity on the upper hemisphere and I'm dr driving it more towards zero at the bottom part as though it's approaching the no-slip condition. And an extreme condition would be that you would actually be satisfying a no-slip condition by some tangency point. Okay, so what this lets you do is to play uh, with the relative contributions of thrust and drag. As you drive this part down here more towards the no-slip condition, it becomes more dominated by drag. Up here, it becomes more dominated by thrust. Or I could switch it around, take B2 to be negative, and have the thrust at the back. And then I would have the drag at the front. So this case where B2, say I take B1 equal to 1, where B2 is positive, then this is what's called a puller. Because in that case, I'm kind of pulling from the front and I'm dragging my posterior, right? And if I have B2 less than zero, this is what's called a pusher. Because now I am applying my motive velocity from the posterior and I'm dragging the front. I'm pushing the front through the fluid. So it's this case, the pusher, 
which conceptually is if you wanted to make a bacterium the round cow, you know, a spherical cow, that would be the bacterium, right? So for a bacterium, I'm pushing fluid back here by turning my little propeller, and this is where I have a no slip on the front. Okay? So these are the cases that, at least in terms of, of kind of where drag and thrust are being applied relative to the direction of locomotion, this is the one that is like a bacterium, roughly. Actually, it looks like a bacterium in the far field, if you looked at the far field velocity. Now, there's another case where B2 is equal to zero. And what that means is you just have a uniform mode of stress along the whole thing. Okay? So you don't really discriminate between front and back in any way. And, and uh, for various reasons, Tim Pedley calls this a stealth swimmer. Okay? And the reason is, is if you looked at its, its uh, perturbative flow, what would be the size of the flow it would be produce as it moves through the fluid, it decays like 1 over x cubed. These two, these are all force-free swimmers, so what that means, we know, a, we know a Stokes monopole decays like 1 over r, so these have to be described by at least dipoles, right? They decay like 1 over r squared. The stealth swimmer has no dipolar part, you have to go to the next order. So the stealth swimmer is 1 over r cubed. These two, so B2 not equal to zero, they decay like one over R squared because they're force dipoles. I haven't shown you, okay, that's right. So I'm, I'm expecting that while I'm talking, your mind has been drifting rightwards and probing the picture on the screen. <laughs> so I'm kind of mixing things a little bit. So just give me a moment and I'll, I'll answer that unless you want to address his question. Okay, R let, me, let me address that, okay? Let me do it by a, a, an extreme example. Remember, this is the tangential, this is the, t the magnitude of this tangential velocity, right? Going down along longitudinal lines. And this is phi equal to zero. Imagine it were this, same picture. Can you, can you see that? Probably not. Let me get rid of this. Bless you, indeed. Here's my swimmer again. See direction. There's phi. Phi equals zero down to phi equals pi. And now imagine what this looks like. So I'm looking at u phi. It's got a baseline. And now what I do is I take B2, well, okay, I'm going to take B2 to be a step function, okay? So let's say instead, here's my B1. I want to forget about B1. Let's just say that the whole thing looked like this, okay? So what that would mean is that in the body frame, I have zero velocity on the lower hemisphere. That's a no-slip condition, right? Good. This, this is the particle frame velocity, okay? If I let it move, then it will have a velocity that, uh, where it's dragging all this fluid because his ass is stuck to it. Okay, 
U, this is part of UB. Okay? So in this case, this is a no subcondition. Does that clear, that clear it up? Good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I, I press very hard with chalk. Any, anybody who has been in the library while I've been working today, I slam really hard on the keys as I'm typing. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so what, what Blake originally wrote this down for was as a model for paramecia swimming. Okay, so here's, here's a paramecium, and I'm, I'm sure this is probably some electron microscope kind of thing, and it's dead and fixed and all these things, whatever. But um, there you can see it's covered with these ciliary propellers or propulsors that it does a power and recovery stroke with. And so you can really think of it as basically something like the stealth swimmer, you would guess. So this case where I just have a, a constant B2. And so that's beta equal to zero. And so if I take a look, there's a nice kind of very technical, no description at all, but Wikipedia page, which I stole this from. So here is the swimmer frame for a stealth swimmer, where all I have, oops, I've got that wrong. It's beta equal to zero now. Oh, that's neutral. Now I have to figure out what this means. Oh, thank you. Oh, I was about to enter insanity. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very much. Okay, there we are. We take, we take B1 to go to relatively. We, we take it, well, okay, we've taken B2 to zero. And so if you look then in the swimmer frame, it's just pumping fluid around it tangentially, okay? And that's what it would look like if I were holding it with some force in the lab frame. And now if you let it go, it swims forward. And you can see it's dragging some fluid along, but it has this kind of complicated, it's kind of a quadrupolar type structure around it. Okay, so let's take a look where beta is negative, and it's, it's the pusher case. If I look in the lab frame, you can see it's pumping fluid back here on the posterior, and then it's got something approximating, a, something getting maybe closer to a no-slip condition up there, so it's creating some weird flow. It's not going exactly to no-slip, so. You can see it's going up a little bit, it's got some rotation. And then when you let it go, so there it is in, in now the lab frame, the real, lab frame velocity. You can see it's pumping fluid back down here. This is more no slippish, so it's pushing fluid up and dragging it with it. Okay? And then the puller case is just turned around. It's moving in the same direction though. It's moving upwards. So we kind of reverse this flow down here. It's pumping fluid down from the top. Something a little more complicated down here. And then it has this flow in the lab frame where you see fluid moving down from the top is dragging fluid up as it moves in this direction. So incompressibility really tells you that in the lab frame, since I'm bringing fluid in like that, it has to be exiting along the sides. Okay? And that's the, uh, and it's doing it, doing kind of the opposite thing if you're looking at the pusher. In the lab frame, the pusher is pumping fluid from the bottom, dragging at the top, but it's moving. So it creates a flow upwards. And so it's coming in from the sides and moving up because it's be being dragged up by the no slip condition and pumped down by the propulsion at the rear. So this is a very, 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 very important point because it has a lot to do with the way swimmers can interact with each other through these induced flows. These guys, as they're moving forward, pump fluid out at the sides while the pullers pull fluid in. This is what's called an extensile flow. This is what's called a contractile flow. So when you hear about pushers and pushers, pullers and extension and contraction and dipoles and all this, this in the fluid mechanics case is what we're talking about. Okay. 
Now, uh, so Blake had originally used it to understand this, and then there's, there's similar kind of squirmer type models, including in our, our own lab at NYU, where that we use to describe things that are these chemically powered Janus particles. For example, we have these chemically induced, actually electric field produced, little currents of fluid running around on the outside and propelling things around. So it's a, it's a useful model. It's very classical, but it's also very useful. Let's see what's on the next one. Uh, okay. I'll just make this point again. Oh, actually, I'll show you something else. Oh, you're missing all sorts of fabulous stuff, but <laughs> we'll come back to it just to, just to make the point. So there, there were a couple of really heroic measurements, and I think certainly the first on the left, and I think the second one too, I think both came out of, of Ray Goldstein's lab. And uh, what they did is they measured the flow field around microorganisms, two of them. One was a bacterium, and the other one was an algae, Chlamydomonas. And there's a bacterium, and what it's showing is the flow field measured around it. I mean, this guy is, you know, 15 microns long. <laughs> Obviously, this took some work. Um, but the main point is, is that there's the head, there's the drag element, there's the thrust. That's a pusher. And you see flow coming in on the sides and exiting. So you have this kind of straining flow coming in and coming out. Chlamydomonas is more complicated. Uh, it has these two uh, cilia up front and it's kind of pushing itself through a breaststroke through the fluid, something like this, dragging itself. Actually, part of its stroke is going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, but on average, it moves forward. It's a really, really crappy swimmer. And But on time average, it has a flow structure that looks like this, that if you, if you look, you realize is this kind of compressive flow that you associate with being a puller. It's coming in this direction and exiting like that. So it has a more complicated kind of near field structure because its two thrust elements are spatially dislocated from each other. Okay. So that's snazzy. Oh yeah. Yeah, I will come back to this, but this is just to show you that little mollusk I told you about that flies. So there it is. Very adorably flying around inside of a test tube. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this. And now let's move on on the Okay, so that's our, our first real little lesson on swimmers. Yes, thank you, yeah. Oops, wrong notes. Now, what, what, I, what I wanted to do was to, to, draw, to derive another piece of arcana of the Stokes equations, which is called the boundary integral formulation of the Stokes equations. And it's to show you, like throw it in your face, uh, how nice the Stokes equations are to work with, why they are so nice to work with. And the reciprocal theorem is already telling you something, right? It's very strange. If, if you were talking about the Navier-Stokes equations and you had some vorticity out there decaying and moving around or something, you wouldn't have anything that looked like a reciprocal theorem because the reciprocal theorem only talks about what's going on on the boundary of things in that integral form, right? You wanted to know about surface stresses and surface velocities, and if you knew a couple of solutions, you could construct something. And it didn't require anything about bulk knowledge. That's a sign of something being a boundary value problem. 
all the information about what goes on in the flow comes from the boundary instantaneously, one way or another. That's not the way it is for Navier Stokes. I throw a vortex off in the fluid, you know, it's not free anymore, right? It's it's part of it has its own degrees of freedom and it's decaying and moving and all this stuff. They're not boundary value problems, only in part. They have boundary data, but they're not boundary value problems. Okay. So so this is what I'll call the classical geez. <laughs> the classical boundary integral formulation. And I and I'm really gonna gloss this over because it would be cruel. But I'll make the main points. And having written it down, you'll, you'll, you'll see why this thing called the reciprocal theorem has to be true. Okay, so here's the problem. I have a fluid domain and it's going to be, I'm now, now I'm gonna lapse into some nice notation. I have a body, we'll call that body B. That body has an outward normal N it has a surface velocity, which we'll call u gamma. We'll call its boundary gamma. And it exerts a stress upon the fluid, the surface stress, which we'll call zeta. And so the fluid domain is just gonna be all of the volume minus this body. Okay, that's the fluid domain. And what we're solving is Stokes, minus grad P plus mu Laplacian mu is equal to zero. Div dot u is equal to zero. We're gonna ask that mod, mod u goes to zero to infinity. And we'll construct a solution with it which is consistent with our assumptions. And that solution will be unique. Uh, and U on the body, or U on gamma. I'm just stating the boundary value problem. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna write it down in an in a over-specified way. And all we'll need to do is to specify one thing or another. That's U gamma. And I have the condition that sigma on the body dotted with the outward normal is minus zeta. Did your hand come up? You were just waving at me. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I had the reciprocal theorem. So I'm after this solution. So I, I'm seeking this solution pair, which I'll call, I'll, I'll write this as, this is the same as div dot sigma, right? So sigma has within it both the pressure and the velocity. So I'm seeking a solution pair, sigma u. That's what I'm after. And I'm going to let sigma tilde v be that induced or that from the Stokeslet and Stresslet fundamental solutions. Okay. And here what I'm here's what I'm gonna do. In particular, now now if I just had the Stokeslet, it has a singularity at the origin. The stresslet has a singularity at the origin by construction, right? So I'm going to displace that. I'm going to take a point here. I'll put it over here. Y, which is in the fluid domain. Not on the boundary, in the fluid domain. Okay? And this guy, this solution pair, 
is just going to be those Green's functions translated to put their singularities at y. Okay? So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, let me do v. v sub i is going to be s sub i j at x minus y. Now I have a dangling index here, which I'm just going to leave dangling. Okay? Because this is the one that just contracted against that e constant e vector. So for any j, this is a this is a completely legit incompressible velocity. And then for sigma ij, sigma tilde ij, or ik, this is going to be the stresslet ijk at x minus y. So I have a I have a dangling index, which I'm just going to leave floating around, untouched, until I need it. And now I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. It's, this is really, this is just slick. I, I, I just like this. They always work this way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create what's called a punctured domain. I'm going to put a little ball around this point where now I have the singularity of one pair of my solutions to the Stokes equations, and I'm going to exclude it from the domain. So let's call this little ball d epsilon of y, domain size epsilon of y. So this is just a sphere of radius epsilon, okay? And so now I have this new domain, which I'll call phi epsilon, which is just this omega minus this d epsilon of y. Okay? And, you know, this has an outward normal. So on. And now all I'm going to do is the following. I'm just going to describe what the, map, what, the, what the idea is now. I have two domains, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate over the domain what is it called? The Lorentz identity, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that thing I keep talking about. Uh, yeah, I won't, I, I won't say what else I forget. It, 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 it took me a, about a year to, to solidly remember my wife's name on request. I'd look at her for a moment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> joy, right? Okay, so you, you, you integrate this divergence, th you integrate the Lorentz identity over this punctured domain, right? So I have a div dot something, and then I move it to the boundary through, through the divergence theorem, right? I'm integrating a divergence, I can move it to surface integrals through the divergence theorem, okay? Does that make sense as words? Divergence theorem, surface integral. <laughs> so, and maybe I'll write down some math too. But I'll just say what happens. So what I'm going to have then is I'm going to have a surface integral from here plus a surface integral from here, each involving, you know, u, sigma, sigma tilde v. The, find in the sum of those integrals is going to be zero because I've integrated the, the Lorentz identity, which is zero. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to examine the integral over this little ball as I take epsilon to zero. Okay? And what happens is that in that limit, the only thing that comes from that integral is u. u sub dangling index j. That's all that comes out of it, is uj. So what you end up with is the statement that says uj here at y plus this integral here is zero. That's an expression for the velocity at a point in the fluid in terms of an integral over this other body. Okay? So I'm just going to write that as some sentences, and, and those of you who are inclined uh, can, can work through the math. Okay. 
So 1 integrate the Lorentz identity over this punctured fluid domain that punctures out an epsilon ball around y. Two, apply the divergence theorem. Theorem. To find something that looks like one integral, i epsilon of y, plus another integral, these are surface integrals over these two things, something over y plus an integral over gamma, which also depends on y, is equal to zero. This does not depend on epsilon though, only this one. So this is the integral, that surface integral over the body. This is the integral over this little tiny ball. Some of these two things is zero. Study i epsilon of y as epsilon goes to zero. There's two contributions. Maybe I. Yeah. Omega epsilon is the fluid domain minus the punctured domain. So it sees the punctured domain as a boundary on which it can throw a surface integral from the divergence theorem. Does that make sense? Oh, oh let me just write it out. Okay, I have it all written here. So here's what we have. Okay, I'm going to puncture the board domain on the left to exclude the punctured domain. Okay, so here is my vi and my sigma ij, and what I have is that del del x something, let me write this out first. There's my real sigma, I want to leave j out of it. So I have a sigma ik, I have a vk, I have a sigma tilde ik, and I have a u k, so this must be a d d x i, that's my free one there, and that's equal to zero, right? And I just told you what this v k and sigma tilde i k are, okay? So now, I'm going to write down the integral over this punctured fluid domain of that dvx del del xi of exactly that vik, I'm sorry, sigma ik vk minus sigma tilde ik uk. Now I apply the divergence theorem there. Are now let me just say, I just, this is in response to another thing yesterday. In order to ignore things at infinity, I have to assume that what is ever out there integrates to zero. Let's assume that. What I will find is a consequence as solutions are objects that will satisfy that condition. Okay? I'll find a velocity that decays like one over r, the u velocity, I will find a stress tensor that decays like one over r squared. In product, that gives me one over r cubed. The area metric for large R is R squared. I have something that goes to zero like one over R. Okay, it's all good. Okay, divergence theorem says this is 
the integral over the boundary d epsilon of y plus, okay, this is equal to the boundary of d epsilon of y ds x n i times sigma i k v k minus sigma tilde i k u k, that's one boundary, plus the second one is the integral over my particle domain gamma ds x n i sigma i k v k minus sigma tilde i k u k and that is equal to zero right because this is zero inside of this integral okay now this is what I was calling i epsilon of y okay because remember this guy that vk is the Stokeslet shifted to have its singularity at y and the sigma is that stresslet shifted to have its singularity at y and there they are these singular bits sitting right here depending upon y and they what's that oh yes thank you it's kind of phonetic writing x sounds like s this guy yeah that's an i that's what you're asking yeah okay so now so this is the integral over the little ball but the little ball you're epsilon away from this singularity so something bad has got to happen as epsilon goes to zero i have an unbounded thing inside and i'm taking the domain closer and closer if it were smooth, if these functions were smooth inside of d epsilon, as I took epsilon to zero, this would go to zero. This would be gone. But it's not. This is the beauty of Green's functions. They have the singularities that you need to get them to produce equations that you like. Okay. Now, these guys, surface stress, surface velocity that we're after, and then these guys also depend on y, but these are completely smooth integrals because y is way off over here where the singularities are. So here I'm integrating something completely smooth. So as epsilon goes to zero, it doesn't care. Okay? Now, here's what happens. So this v here, we're going to assume that this sigma, this surface stress, now I have an ni sigma ik, that's a surface stress, right? We're going to assume that's smooth over the ball. This guy has a 1 over r singularity in it, right? I'm integrating over a sphere, a 1 over r singularity. Sphere has an area metric that looks like r squared, or epsilon squared. It's the size epsilon sphere. So that thing inside, as I get closer, is blowing up like 1 over epsilon. But the area metric is going to 0 like epsilon squared. So this term that involves the Stokeslet goes to zero, as epsilon goes to zero. So I should finish this, my little bit of writing. What I call it? I gamma, also y. Okay, so this guy here, I should pull it out. The integral over delta d epsilon of y ds x n i sigma i k and now I'll write this as s i or s s s k j right and then it's a x minus y and this is an x and this is an x right this is the one that I'm talking about that first integral this guy blows up like 1 upon epsilon the area metric this whole thing goes to 0 like epsilon squared so that integral goes to 0 as epsilon goes to 0 
okay? It's the second one that gives you, is, gives you a gift. Uh, you know, cats like to give gifts. They bring you a dead mouse. It's not that kind of thing. So now I look at this second integral here. This is the one that involves the stresslet, which has a singularity that is going to blow up like epsilon to the minus 2. It's more singular which balances the way that the area metric goes to zero. So this one has the potential, unless there's some symmetry, it has the potential to give you a contribution. Okay? And it turns out that the contribution that it gives you is, let me just write it here, as epsilon goes down to zero. This one gives you a zero, and this one gives you a plus, what's my free index? Uj at y. That's what the second integral gives you as epsilon goes to zero. It produces a delta function. Yeah? We're not talking about physics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the wrong class. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Give me one moment, and then you're then you're not going to worry about the physics anymore. Okay, okay, <laughs> and then that will be great. <laughs> okay, but here's what happens now. I take epsilon to zero, and here's what I get. So I'm just asking you now. Don't think about physics. Just admire the calculation. Okay. What it gives you is the following. What it gives you is that u at the point y, I can write as I have u of y plus this other integral. I'm going to move the integral over to the other side. It's the integral over gamma s of x prime minus y, x prime is going to be my surface integral variable, the surface stress, x prime, plus an integral over gamma. Let me put in here, there should be a ds x prime, ds x prime, and then it's u gamma, the surface velocity at the point x prime, is third rank tensor at, I have to get this direction right, and hat x prime. That's what I get as epsilon goes to zero. Okay? So what I just did is I showed you that if I give, if I know the surface stress and I know the surface velocity, I can construct the velocity anywhere in the fluid. Okay? Yeah. Well, yeah, there, there might be a constraint on, on something like the integral of u gamma dot n, if that's what you're asking, like some sort of surface flux or volume constraint. Otherwise, I would have to let my volume shrink or grow or something. Yes. Right. So, so you can write down other kinds of integral equations to find other things. So, so it turns out that I called this the classic integral equation because there are many, many different kinds of integral equations that one may want to solve for the Stokes to determine different things in nice ways for the Stokes equations. Now. This is what I have. So there's this stupid joke about 
mathematicians or machines for consuming coffee. They're also producing little pieces of chalk. Okay. So, so, but this is the point I just want you to absorb, is that in this case, if I just know boundary data, I know everything. I can construct everything. You'll see, you'll see that in a moment. Yeah. Boundary data determines the fluid velocity everywhere in omega, the fluid domain. This little ball is gone. It's been epsilon away. Okay. Now, there's one thing left to do. Can I close this? So here I had my point Y out here. There's my boundary, where my boundary data lives. I want to get intimate with my boundary data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, what happens if I pick a point X on the boundary and I take a limit as Y goes to X? Right? That's a nice question. Well, what happens is you introduce a singularity, and, and so, so these are objects that have singularities at my field point, Y. So I'm bringing the singularity to the boundary. So again, I have to do some asymptotic analysis. What happens is I get closer and closer to the boundary. And so I'll tell you what happens. So if I let y go to x, this s, again, has, is singular, but it has, a, it has an integrable singularity. I can I just pass to the limit, and it has an integrable singularity. I'm fine. And again, that's because an area metric on the surface, if I have a little epsilon ball, it's going to look like epsilon squared. If I cut it out, I have a 1 over epsilon singularity. It's not a problem. This guy, on the other hand, presents some difficulties. What it does is, because I'm, I'm kind of, if you, if you want to think about it in terms of now having, I'm cutting out like half a ball, <laughs> something like that, right, a whole ball. This guy produces one half of u at the boundary plus a principal value integral, which is the cost of having taken that limit. So what I get is that u of x, so now I can call it u gamma of x, because there's y goes to x, u of x goes to, I mean, u of y goes to u gamma of x, right? That's the no slip condition. And so what I end up getting is 1 half u gamma of x is equal to integral dsx, <laughs> I did it again, dsx prime over gamma s of x prime minus x zeta of x prime plus integral over gamma ds x prime. And now I'm going to put a p on top of there to mean that it's a, princi it's a principal, value al principal value type. u gamma of x prime t x prime minus x, n hat x prime. Okay? So, here's, your, here's the constraint part. I have an integral relation, which I can, move which I can evaluate by moving points around on the boundary, point x. That relates, now remember this guy right here, that is minus sigma on the boundary dot n. That's the negative of the fluid stress on the boundary, right? So what this is, is it's something that's relating my two bits of boundary data. 
So it's over constrained. So, but here's the way it works. You give one or the other. What I have now is an integral equation that will determine either u of gamma or zeta, depending on what other bit of information I specify. Okay? So if my boundary data is u gamma, I'm telling you how the boundary moves, possibly under some constraints on u gamma. Then what you can solve this integral equation and determine what the surface stress has to be. Once I've solved this equation for the surface stress, I stick both my u gamma and my surface stress up into this equation and I've constructed the velocity everywhere. Okay? And vice versa. I can specify surface stress. I have a second kind Fredholm integral equation. Extremely nice for those of you that compute for u gamma. Well conditioned. There's a whole story here I don't want to go into. Obviously I'm alluding to something. Solve it and you play the same game again. Okay, so this is the equation you solve to express one bit of boundary data in terms of another bit of boundary data. You need both of those in order to construct the velocity. It's used in practice all the time. You, you, you know, you know this, this, is, this is a prejudice. <laughs> so so uh, you have singular integrals, right? People don't like to think about singular integrals, but it turns out there's an awful lot known about how to do quadratures of singular integrals to very high orders of accuracy. There's an enormous amount known about how to do that now. So the problem, it turns out, is not how do I accurately evaluate these. You can evaluate these to any order you want to suggest with modern quadrature methods, numerical quadrature methods. There are other problems which I come in at a applications level. I have to do with what happens when I have two bodies that are very close to each other. Yes. Oh, thank you. Can I can I answer your question now? Yeah. Okay. So there was nothing in here that said I had only one that this would only work for one body. Right? So imagine that instead I had multiple bodies. Body one. Body two, body three, okay? I would do exactly the same. I would take a point Y here and I would puncture the domain. I would, I would have the same kind of integral to analyze, all that stuff. And I would end up getting that I would have U of Y sitting here and it would be equal to the integral of that thing over this boundary plus this boundary plus that boundary, right? So I would replace this by a sum over the union of the B sub i's with no problem. Okay? That's just divergence theorem again. I just get surface integrals over every immersed domain in the, in the fluid. And now what I do is I generate three integral equations and they're all coupled together. First, I take a limit to that boundary, then I take a limit to that boundary, then I take a limit to that boundary. Okay? This first one will produce an integral equation that say looks something like, let's say I'm specifying surface stress. I would have something that would look like this. The surface velocity of the first body, it has a surface velocity, U1. plus an integral over gamma one, and it would be a principal value integral. Uh, da -da, what do I need? I need an N, I need all that stuff. I'll put a minus sign here. Minus N X prime T, 
I have to get. I always you always have to worry about it's x prime minus x. Yeah. I won't tell you what you have to worry about. Right? I'd have something that looked like this. And then I would have an integral, which is not a principal value integral, which would be the integrals of these same things over these other bodies. Gamma 2 plus gamma 3. N. Gamma. Or rather, I have too many Ns. Why weren't you asking me? Every time I have an error, you speak up. Sorry, I shouldn't point. That's very rude. <laughs> it's also very rude to pick people out of the audience and ask them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're primed. <laughs> yeah. U gamma I T X prime minus X and I hat X prime. So I would have taking the limit to this first one would generate a bunch of terms that look like this, where one part has the one half plus the principal value integral. And that would be equal to the sum of all these other integrals with the boundary data on the stress. Sum of Stokes -Lid integrals. And then you would have another integral equation for u2, another one for u3. You would have three integral equations for three unknowns given on the right-hand side as functions of three unknowns, three surface stresses. You solve them in a coupled fashion. Okay, so there is nothing conceptually difficult with having multiple bodies. Now, what's the wonderful thing about this that I haven't said? What did it do for me? What do you, who, how many people in here work in CFD at all? Computational fluid dynamics. Oh, come on. You can admit it. <laughs> What's that? Modelers, simulators, all these kind of slightly insulting phrases that are used. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So my, po my point is this. Is that, I, is that I turned a volume integral, an integral I would have to solve over a volume, into something which is just a set of integral equations over immersed surfaces. So what I did is I reduced the dimension from three dimensions to two. So instead of thinking about it in terms of volume solves of some PDE, I just have a bunch of surface integral solves. The cost is that the surface integrals are singular, but I'm telling you, that's not a big cost. The other thing is that these kernels arise from a classical equation of mathematical physics. They have Green's algebraic Green's functions. What that means is that things like fast multipole methods work extremely well. Okay, there are very, very fast methods for doing summations of, or, so what is this? This is a convolution integral, right? That's a convolution. It's on a surface. If it were on a flat plane and I were sampling it uniformly, I could use an FFT and the discrete convolution theorem and do it in O of n squared log n, if I had n squared points. You can evaluate this in O of n squared, if I have n squared points on a surface, using fast multipole. It has a far bigger coefficient. Usually you get beat by FFT if you can use it, but usually you can't. So they're very fast methods for evaluating integrals like this after you have approximated them by a quadrature of some sort based on fast multiple methods. Yeah. That's, well, how true is that? So, so let me give you another example. When does it become more effective to use an FFT to evaluate a discrete Fourier transform than, say, just to, just to use the form and just sum it up, the O of n squared method? Typically, it's 18. It used to be 18. It might be lower now, actually. Okay? So, yes. You know, if you have a low, if you have a, you know, there can be O of n methods that have big coefficients. 
and you might need some number of points before it becomes cost efficient to use it rather than something else. In the problems that we're working on, we may have something like 100,000 unknowns to figure out. And then in those kind of regimes where you have complex geometry and you're interested in solving a big, interesting, big and interesting problem, then, uh, then it becomes very cost effective to move into more analysis based methods like fast multipole methods. So, yeah. Oh, that's because on the, on the left-hand side here, I, had a, I have a U. This guy pops out a one-half U. Bring it over to the other side, you get a half. Yes? I'm sorry? Yeah. The reciprocal theorem has to be true. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my point is what, what I've, it's not that the reciprocal theorem was true, it's just that a step that I took required that I had a certain amount of decay. All right. Now, what, what I did is, as a consequence of assuming that, I get exactly solutions that have that decay that I needed. That's what I was saying. Okay. So, so the main, so two points, multiple bodies are easy. And here I'm going to put this in quotes. They're easy formulationally. There are things, uh, a current area of a lot of work in these methods is having them be accurate when bodies are very close. That's still an ongoing topic. Uh, why? Did I hear why? Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's this simple problem. It's, it's been conquered in 2D pretty well. But imagine, I'll just describe it in 2D. Imagine I have, I've, I've have a surface that I've discretized by some set of points, and I'm moving those points around. And then I have another surface where it's come, it has come nearby. It has a set of points. Well, as this one, remember I have a, I have a, an integral, a cross integral, right? Which is asking, I have a surface integral that's centered at this point, and it has a singularity in it. Well, it's not singular until I actually hit it, but it's near singular the closer I get. So my quadratures, unless you're very careful, become very inaccurate. And you have to think about how to do that. That's it in a nutshell. That's the, that's the why. Oh, that's one. Sometimes coming very close, depending on the physics, means that the uh, densities associated with the physics are becoming very sharp because of close interactions. That's another thing you have to worry about. So one, multiple bodies are easy. Two, fast methods exist. <laughs> you, you mean they become fast at three? Yes, that's what he, this is when. <laughs> they become fast at three. And they're used for doing many bodies. Okay, and, uh, and the cost per time step See, I'm, I'm evangelizing here a bit because we spend a lot of time developing these methods and friends around us spend a lot of time. And we'd certainly like to see them used. Because they're technical, because they have singularities and things like this, people are kind of put off. But, but it's like an FFT. Nobody writes their own FFT anymore. You go, well, I did, but anyway, you, you go off and you find FFTW, right? And you compile FFTW on your machine and it, it works great. You would not go in and touch FFTW for your personal application, whatever it was. You would not enter that code. You should, you know, if you were, you should, you, you should be executed. That's, that code is written by professionals. 
And there's going to be that level of software engineering in some of these methods where you can get very, very good methods for doing certain things. They do it with checks on whether things are going good or going bad and you know, quality control things are heavily tested. And that's kind of where software in this area is getting to. Okay, so cost per time step, if I have n squared points, the cost is O of n squared to solve these problems per time step. On the surfaces, n squared discretization points on the surfaces. Okay, now with that, I thought I'd show you some applications. Yes, it's multiplicative in that. Yes. One second. Yes. Well, there's there's a library called PVFMM, which is uh, what's called the kernel independent fast multipole method. It comes out of the University of Texas at Austin, George Biros's group. Yeah. Uh, we are now compiling L at at the Flatiron Institute, where I and Wen work. We are compiling libraries to do to do various. I'll show you a result of one of them uh, that you can you can download, for example. Uh, who else? Leslie Leslie Greengard's group maintains uh, various types of, of uh, codes that you can you can bundle into MATLAB or C or Python or something like that to do various fast multipolish type integral equation solves for you things things like that. So it's it's kind of getting bundled together slowly in various places, but, but it's out there. You can, you can find it. You it's like pulling pieces in to solve sub pieces of bigger problems. It's not going to solve your big problem that's specific to what you're working on, but you could speed up elements of it by finding things like this floating around. <laughs> so so uh, this kind of stuff is used very heavily in the chip industry actually design of chips because there's a boundary integral formulation of, of Maxwell. And uh, it's kind of amusing. Leslie Greengard actually left uh, academics for a few years and started a company uh, where he was making software for the chip industry. And he did it right when the dot com, you know, there's a similar story. Leslie, st Leslie started a uh, fast multifold based kind of chip design company. My parents started a charter fishing business in Hawaii. They had the same outcome. Um, <laughs> my parents hit the oil shocks of the 1970s and people quit coming to Hawaii. And Leslie hit the dot-com meltdown. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. But one, one thing that happened, for example, is that is a lot of uh, Leslie's software from that time got tied up uh, under various legal agreements. So, but, uh, I don't think that there's a fluid mechanics solver that uses fast multipole as a commercial. Not that I've seen. Yeah, there's Comsol, uh, Fluent, some other things. There's some open source stuff, open foam, uh, which is a FEM, finite element type thing. Most of it's either finite elements or uh, volume of fluid, finite difference methods of some sort. Oh, okay. So, so when I said there's difficulties when bodies get close, right? Yeah. So, if you have a collision, that's creating all sorts of problems. It's, it's creating a singular event. It's uh, causing problems and kind of these kind of integral equation things. And so, uh, that's actually what Wen's poster is about up outside is how in a special case, how you come up with very fast collision handling strategies uh, for, in this case, I th think that poster's on spheres and uh, actually also on microtubules. Mm. 
No, it's not an issue. Moving without colliding, it's, yeah, motion itself is not an issue. That's a very, that's a very uh, interesting area, I would say. So the, uh, the problem you have to say about deformation, if you're, you're talking about surface tension, you're talking about elasticity. If you're talking about things like that, which means that they are geometrically based forces, then there are nice methods for doing implicit time stepping. Okay, here, okay, why do you want to do implicit time stepping? Here's, here's the problem. How many people know what implicit time stepping is? Okay, most everybody. Let's say I'm solving du dt is equal to minus four derivatives in x on u. I'm solving that problem, which is like an elasticity problem in an overdamped medium. Okay? If you discretize u in x there's and do a, something like the Euler method, then there's a time step constraint that you have to impose on your Euler method that says that the time step delta t has to be less than some constant times delta x to the fourth. And that's a, this comes out of a little bit of algebra, okay? So what that means is that the smallest scales that you're resolving in your problem are dictating how much time you're having to spend evolving it forward just to satisfy a stability constraint on a discrete scheme. It's not an issue of accuracy. Accuracy lives at larger scales. Accuracy is a long wavelength quantity, really, as long as you're treating the small wavelength stuff in a stable way. That's why you do things like implicit schemes, implicit Euler, uh, BDF schemes, things like that, backward differentiation formulas, other fancier schemes. You do things implicitly and the whole point is when you have geometrically based forces, you can often treat them implicitly in a way that's a linear solve at each time step, which you can do efficiently. And in fact, there was a, uh, how many people know what the Gordon, Pri Gordon Bell Prize is? One, two, the people I would expect to know what the Gordon Bell Prize is. So uh, every year, or maybe it's every two years, I, I, don't, I don't remember, but there's a, there's a big computational physics competition. Who can do the sexiest big calculation on something? <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's how, how it's described on something. And so about eight years ago, uh, a group around George Biros and uh, also involving people at NYU won the Gordon Bell Prize for using boundary integral simulations to evolve forward 240 million red blood cells that had an elastic membrane as a, as a model for the red blood cell. 240 million. I think they used 250,000 cores on some DOE machine. Now here's the bite. They evolved it forward for like 100 time steps. It kind of went, mm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and <then> it stopped. <laughs> so, so anyway, but, but in that they used, they could only get that uh because they had done implicit time stepping actually to handle the stiffness constraints they come with the having elasticity, but they were able to get some deformation, reasonable deformation out of it. So we want to do better than that. Okay, but here are some examples. I should have, I should have found the Gordon Bell Prize one. But uh, this was from two years ago or last year, I think. But what this is, is just a uh, solve of a pressure driven Stokes flow. This is a, this is a steady state problem because all I'm doing is saying I have a bunch of bodies, so I've, I've thrown Fruit Loops into a device. They have a no slip condition and I'm pumping fluid through it using a pressure gradient, okay? And the point is, is that there's a lot of bodies and geometrically it's very complicated. And this is being solved to something like 12 digits of accuracy, okay? Try to, try to do that with fluent, okay? How big is it? Well, you, you know, here the cost is if I have 100 points per boundary, then it's 100 points times the number of boundary points with some prefactor. So this is run on a laptop, actually. 
I have no, I would have to take a look at the paper. Yeah. Uh, you got me. So the, so the way I, you know, I don't know. I just don't know. This, this is a method that is tuned to the, to the PDE. Everything in this is built around a particular PDE that you want to solve. This is all very special purpose software. So as soon as you wander out of the, of the domain of solving a homogeneous Stokes equation, then it's, then it's, a, different, it's a different world. So that's the one thing to so say, is that you have to say that I want to solve a problem with the Newtonian Stokes fluid very badly. And that's the problem I want to solve. So all this software is tuned for that. This is 2D. So this is a 3D problem. And, and this I'll probably talk about on Wednesday. And so this is a model for the centering of a pronuclear complex inside of an embryo by the polymerization forces created by microtubules pushing on the boundary. So this is using a thousand microtubules. Okay, and they're attached to a payload. And what's supposed to happen is its payload is supposed to be moved from here into the center and rotate so that this axis between these microtubule bundles is in the long axis. This is what's observed to happen in experiments. So when I first did this kind of simulation about 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago, I used an immerse boundary method. This is with a postdoc, uh, Tamar Shinar. And we used an immerse boundary method to do this, and we were able to do 50 microtubules. Immerse boundary method is a volume method. You're doing a volume solve. In this case, what we're doing is we're using an asymptotic reduction of the, of the Stokesian dynamics induced by long slender things into line integrals. So when you have a long skinny thing, then you can replace all of these surface integrals with line integrals. So these all become just integrals of forces along lines. You have a boundary integral sitting on that surface and on the containing surface, and they're all talking to each other. And this is all being knit together with this fast multipole framework. And it's costing O of N per time step. And again, Here's the bite. You have to really want to solve this problem. And you, and you have to be willing to say that I know that the, that the rheology of the cytoplasm in the cell might very well be viscoelastic, but I won't be able to do the same level of complexity if I assume that. So I'm going to assume that it's not. And then I'm going to bring in this special purpose machinery and see how far I get. Okay. So. I take that, I really want to solve that problem, and I give it to a postdoc, and I say, you really want to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Asan Nazikdast and Abtin Rahimian. Okay. Now, um, this is slightly a slightly different problem. This is a simulation that Wen did on a laptop. No, yeah, I didn't think so. Kayla was writing on a laptop with, I think, a thousand particles or something. But yeah, okay. So this is a hundred. So this is a hundred thousand swimming rods, where we're using a reduced order version of, of the integral stuff for representing the dynamics of the rod. Basically, they, they're looking like a bunch of forced dipoles, each of them, and that's kind of the entirety. And then there's a collision interaction scheme buried in this so they can run into each other and bounce off. And all the summation of all the dipolar stuff is done in a fast multipole framework. And the other piece that, that Wen has worked on actually in the past couple of years is having fast ways for putting in a boundary. So this is a suspension of swimming things over a no-slip boundary. And in the context of these kernel independent fast multiple methods, whatever that means, having periodic boundary conditions handled efficiently. Because fast multiple methods are kind of on their face, are ways of solving free space Green's function problems. And having periodic boundary conditions is not so obviously done easily. That takes a little bit of work. But here it is. 
These are pushers, 100,000 pushers. Swimming around in a bulk of fluid. They're capped up here at the top. There's actually more fluid up here. It's just that you put a virtual wall that you don't let them pass through. And then a no slip condition here. You can see they're aggregating slope more slowly moving down there and kind of roiling around kind of, if you like, bacterial turbulence that we've come to study. Okay, now, so this is, this is what I would call less of a boundary integral formulation than a singularity method is based on a low order approximation of the dynamics by some, by some singular solutions to Stokes. But there's so many of them, you really need a fast method to actually evolve forward, even this kind of low order approximation of things. And so this is, this is on the left, this is a similar kind of problem, actually, uh, despite how complicated it looks, it's, it's a little bit easier. And this is actually the dynamics, uh, this is work with uh, David Santillan and Alexander Zadowska. Alexandra looks at the dynamics of the chromatin fibers inside of the nucleus. And this is an active polymer dynamics model of how it might be moving around because of the action of motors on the fiber. So anyway, these kinds of methods for Stokes can be very powerful, but you have to decide that what you want to solve is Stokes. What's that? Well, yeah, let me, uh, that's a very good question, which I, which I will say what we, let me talk about, that's kind of a long answer. Yeah, I, I think that hydrodynamics is not as important to the real problem as it looks like here, but what you see come out of this is ordering and hydrodynamics is locally important to ordering. That's what I think. It's kind of a long question. Okay, now here's another problem. And uh, this is now just a much simpler problem, which is shape optimization. So there's been some very, for swimmers, so there's been some very nice work in, in the past decade on building uh, micro swimmers of various sorts. And these come out of uh, the group of uh, Gauche and Fisher. And I've forgotten whose that was. That might have been, that might have been Fisher too, actually. That might be Pear Fisher too. Is it? Yeah. And uh, so what they, what they have made are kind of helical objects that they can rotate with a magnetic field and then make swim by the rotation. And so if you're, if you're a low Reynolds number fluid dynamicist, you're going to know this is this because of the way the fabrication worked. In this case, it's a delamination. You end up with this as though you had just cut out the surface of the cylinder and you ended up with this. You know this is not a very good way of exerting force on a fluid because it's kind of all lined up with the fluid. You want to have things that are transverse in the direction of your motion. You want to push stuff back. And so with uh, a couple of postdocs, what we did is pose a boundary integral formulation, not the one that I showed you, but a, a different kind of boundary integral formulation where we would solve for solid body motion and the integral equation was solving for the surface stresses. Surface stresses let you calculate things like drags and all these, all this sorts of stuff that you talk about efficiencies. And we were also able to embed it in a shape optimization problem, basically a steepest descent involving an adjoint reformulation of the problem. But you do shape optimization and you can improve the speed by some factor, I think this is two or something like that. Or if you just took uh, these little glass swimmers and you lengthened out the tail, you can speed them up by quite a lot because you have some interference between the tail and the body that you can, you can kind of get rid of. So anyway, and this is all based on boundary integral formulation kinds of problems. It'd be hard to do it in kind of a semi-analytical computational way otherwise. Um, Oh, we are out of time. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do next time. Can I take one minute? Yeah. So uh, because of this integral formulation, what I showed you was that on the boundary, there was a linear relationship between surface velocity and surface stress, okay? Let's say that what I do is I tell you what the surface velocities are up to translations and rotations or up to some sort of shape deformation. That's like the Blake swimmer, right? 
That's the basis for what's called the reciprocal theorem, really. Reciprocal theorem says, if I have a body that undergoes a set of surface deformations that may involve changes in shape or not, but certainly motion of, of things along the surface, and it moves itself thereof and then exactly reverses them, then the reciprocal theorem says, and it really comes from knowing that you have a linear relation like this, you will come back to exactly the same place. Okay, and it really devolves from having a relation like that between surface stress and surface velocities. So uh, I'll talk about the how you break the reciprocal theorem next time a bit. In for example, when you have inertia, why do we always see things that have helices and waves? Well, it's because of the reciprocal theorem. How does it get broken in interesting ways? So I'll talk about that a bit, and then we'll move on to collective behavior of swimmers. Okay.